Hi, Gordon. How are you, mate? I'm really good. How are you? Yeah, no, I'm brilliant. Thanks. What have you been up to lately? Anything exciting? I've just had a bubble tea and I'm not sure if it was a good idea. You just had a what? Bubble tea. Oh, well, we've talk- have we talked about bubble teas before? Have we? I don't think so. Possibly. Have we not? Still a bad idea. They, re- they remain a bad idea. Is it, is, is it like a drink with bubbles in? Is that what it is? It's got these little like, tad, not tadpoles, frogs spawn in the bottom. Tadpoles? So not actually. Well, one day. Maybe that's why I'm feeling a bit dodgy now. <laughs> um, yeah, they look so nice and so pretty, but oh, one of them and you kind of, mm, it is like eating frog spawn, but with a slightly tannic sort of brown sugar flavour. Yeah, you've not sold it to me. <laughs> How are you? Well, I do have a pond down the garden and it is that kind of time of year when they're going to start spawning, isn't it? So maybe I'll go and make myself one. You've got some evaporated milk in, you've got basically got bubble tea. You know, I'm really good. I'm much better behaved now. Um, for people who listen regularly, they know that I've been on steroids recently, which have caused me to be a bit hyper. Um, but I finished those last week. So, yeah, my world's returned to a normal degree of hyperness, not just that, not, not that manic hyperness that I was experiencing. I think the last it's, couple of weeks. It's, it's not perceptible to the normal observer, but I believe you, Lee. I believe you've calmed down. <laughs> Lee Davis and Gwilym Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. Anyway, we've got a really exciting podcast today, but let me... Let me, before we introduce our guest, see how much you know about the subject. I thought that might be quite an interesting thing to do. So how much do you know about the Earthshot Prize? Me, I'm pretty sure we did a podcast on it. We did. I know. And I'm just seeing if you can remember what it was all yeah, about. No, no. Um, David Attenborough um, does a, like a, a karaoke act with Prince William at one point. That's he does. That's right. Yeah. They do. Don't, don't go breaking my heart. I remember that with um, John <laughs> and Kiki D back in track. Um now let, 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 let me, let me summarise it, shall I, for people properly, who aren't familiar properly. with it? Yes. Shall I do that? So Earthshot Prize, you're right, um, created by um, the Royal Foundation. So His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, as he is now, David Attenborough, highly involved. It's awarded each year to five winners for their contributions to environmentalism. It was first awarded in 2021 and it will run annually until 2030, I think. Each winner gets a million pound grant. So that's um, that's not to be sniffed at. And the um, the awards are presented across five categories. That's um, they're the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the restoration and protection of nature, air cleanliness, ocean revival, waste-free living, and climate action. And guess what, Gwilym? Say what? Go on. Oh, send your, send oh what, Lee, what, Lee, what, Lee, what, Lee? Do you know, I think that people might be guessing from the build up where we're going here. So, uh, SEPA... Because in the first year of Earthshot, we gave quite a lot of um, pro bono advice around um, the IP that was underpinning some of the nominations. Um, last year, we were given the opportunity to be a nominator organisation. There's three. There's 349 nominating organisations, and we're we're one of those. So small cog in a very very big machine, and um, and we nominated something like 30 or so nominees for the 2022. Earthshot Prize, and we only went and got three finalists. Three <laughs> out of fifteen finalists were super nominees, and we backed a winner. Yeah, we backed a winner, not Pla. And um, and Pierre is with us today. Pierre, say hello. Hi everyone. How are you doing, How are you? sir? Yeah, I'm feeling uh, very, very good because uh, I actually just came back from a whole retreat week organized by the Earthshot Prize. So. I'm full of uh, motivation and inspiration, but we'll we'll talk about that later. Yeah, so so let's let's congratulate you first. Well done you. on the award, amazing. Um, how did it feel? It was really a, an incredible moment because actually in the life of startups, there's very few things that are kind of like happening in just an instant. Yeah. Um, you work on like a like a, a new kind of like fundraising round, and it takes kind of like months and months. And finally, when you kind of like get the the, the money transfer to the bank account, it's been so long, and and everyone has been working on this for 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 months that it doesn't feel like that instant moment of uh, of, of success. Uh, whereas awards and grants, they really feel like that. So the moment that we heard on the earpiece, we were like filmed by the BBC, waiting to see our reaction. And when we heard uh, uh, David Beckham say the winner is not Pla, it was like absolutely incredible feeling. <laughs> oh, and we, we we couldn't have been more chuffed for you. It was yeah, I had my own little kind of moment. 
we i think it was on because it was on the telly wasn't it because i actually yeah i caught that bit on, i think i saw it you guys are on telly i think i think i caught that bit you were <laughs> all looking extremely cheerful on uh, that no it, was, it is exciting it's so cool it is so cool so good it's, it's fantastic that you've um given out your time to come on the pod because you must be such a busy man now well yeah it's definitely uh increased uh the number of uh meetings that we have uh, in the past few weeks uh which is very nice it's it's great like we we didn't kind of like quite realize how high profile this uh this this award is and and how much kind of like support the whole earth prize team is putting to kind of like make the most of it so it's been an absolute uh amazing past month really so is is it's opening new doors for you massively i think that uh there's just kind of like layers and layers of things that um, like a, a big prize like that do for uh, an early stage startup. But uh, like from commercial traction to investment, uh, attracting talents, uh, getting media coverage, all of these things have become increasingly kind of like uh, easy to do. So it's great. <laughs> and you've got the small problem of what do you spend a million pound on? Exactly. Right. Um, <laughs> that's a nice uh, added value. Um, so yeah, there's definitely uh, a lot of exciting things happening in 2023 for us. Should we um should we roll it back to the beginning? Should we end up at the Earthshot Prize and talk a little about bit about you and the the kind of the invention and and how you got okay. to to where you are? Is that is that okay? Uh, I did a little bit of a search, obviously, because it's my job to kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, so was it about 2014 you set off on this journey? Is that right? Correct. Uh, just as we graduated from. Uh, a uh, master's at Imperial College and Royal College of Art, where I met my co-founder, Rodrigo Garcia Gonzalez. And um, how how did you stumble across the wonderful kind of capabilities of seaweed? I'm a, I should say I'm a sea fisherman, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a obsessive sea fisherman, and I hate seaweed with a vengeance because of what <laughs> it does to my line and tackle and so on. So come on, sell, sell me on the amazing benefits of seaweed. So to give it a, a little bit of context, so Notpla, uh, the, the startup that we co-founded back in 2014, uh, we developed sustainable packaging made from seaweed as an alternative to single-use plastics. And we certainly came to realize the value of, uh, of seaweed after quite a lot of like research and exploration. Uh, it isn't a uh, traditional material to start with, uh, as you said, not many people are naturally drawn to seaweeds, um, and it's, it's one of those that uh, we tend to kind of like uh, like not think for uh, like the things that they could do, but more of a nuisance on the beach. It's kind of smelly, uh, as you say. It can like get in your lines. Um, so uh, starting from like the, the beginning, we um, like uh, we we met with my co-founder uh, like during this masters uh, after having both kind of like had a little kind of like go at. Uh, uh, a previous professional career so it was kind of a way to come back and study for a little bit uh, uh of time to really uh try to find a, a different direction i used to be a packaging engineer so i was working for l'oreal the cosmetics company uh making single-use plastic products in the hundreds of millions and wow. definitely like uh having that uh that moment of pause in front of the conditioning lines where you're like where is this all going and the <laughs> is going to be there for hundreds of years. Um, and so after quitting that job, um, I, I I met Rodrigo during this master's. And one of the early exploration that we uh, decided to work on was how do you make a man-made fruit? What kind of materials could we use to create packaging that would feel more like something you find in nature than something you find out of a factory? And it was this idea that like, if we can create things like fruit, they're going to feel so much more kind of like in adequation with the rest of nature. And um, we started this in our kitchen because we didn't have access to labs or anything. That was the safe place to cook up some weird things. Wow. And we actually looked at uh, bubble tea, uh, tapioca seeds. Ah. These <laughs> really? uh, I was researching for Pierre. Exactly. That's what I was doing. Was really great setup. Um, so uh, all of these kind of like different uh, gums and roots and uh uh, gelling agents that you can find in plants. Uh, we, we started looking at them. Um, and by chance, we stumbled upon uh, like a technique called spherification for making fake caviar uh, that was invented in the 1940s by Unilever for making this cheap alternative to the real expensive caviar. And that technology was developed 
used extensively in, in the food uh, processing world, but nowhere really else than, than, than in that particular application. And the great thing about these uh, like technologies that have been in the public domain for a while is that you can just go and like read the patents and understand what people were using. They give pretty good breakdown of what material they were using. And that particular technique was using uh, extracts from brown seaweed as a way of kind of like creating these edible jelly like little bubbles that contain a little bit of uh, like fish smelling liquid. And that really was like uh, the, the starting point for our experimentation with, with seaweed. And we actually realized that like by um, like a few different tweaks and, and changes, we could make the bubble bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that we could get to the size of like a cherry tomato and then a whole tomato and then an orange. And we even made some that were like the size of like a, a, a melon. And so we could make these really weird, transparent, jelly-like bubbles that contain water. Uh, back then, they were extremely fragile and they tasted like seaweed. And it was quite kind of like far from a, a final, final product. But what was really exciting is that you could eat that packaging because it was coming from the world of food. So it was really like the peel of a, like a, an apple. It's something that you might not want to eat, but you can. And I think that that was something that was really interesting to us. And we thought, well, how, how could we make this material actually do that, that job well? And uh, we had only a month to work on this. So it was a relatively short project and we were going to move on to the next thing. So we just wrapped it up into a little video that we put online as a little mini tutorial, license it as Creative Commons, and just kind of like let people play with that very rudimentary um, food experiment. And to our surprise, people loved it. There were so many people re replicating this in their kitchen. We had some videos getting like millions of views, tens of millions of views. So this little project that was like not refined, not kind of like fully uh, resolved, got us uh, a bit of a platform and a lot of attention and people started to really think, is this the, the next alternative to plastic? And, and and that's, I think, the moment we realized that it was, that more people than just us were excited about this thing. And it was worth uh, going and trying to develop it for practical, large-scale uh, industrialization rather than just making it a an experiment for the Sunday afternoon in your kitchen. And that was really the starting point. I can't imagine that Gwilym is sitting there now thinking about anything other than you put it on YouTube before you had protected it. Yeah, and we, we licensed it as Creative Commons. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> so the amazing thing about this is that at that point, we didn't really have kind of like um, any intention to become um, entrepreneurs. We were really uh, interested in the innovation of these products and how they could potentially have an impact. And, and I think that we would have probably given up working on this if it wasn't for the amazing reception that we got from people and also like this first phase, which was completely open innovation, people brainstorming about like weird things. Some people deep fried them. Uh, some people were kind of like putting all sorts of kind of like glitter on them. There were all sorts of crazy stuff that was happening in people's kitchen. They were all contributing to this online. And that was an amazing starting point. And at that point, we were um, very happy that people would be able to make this themselves because so many technologies are something that like only happens in the factory of like a very big complex um, industry company. But this was something you could make at home. You could like cook it at home. And so I think that was a major element in us picking this up to go to the next phase, which was going from the kitchen to actually how do we solve this problem at a much bigger scale and how do we make it work industrially with like much better performance? How do we resolve all of the different aspects so that actually it has a like a real impact on the world. Uh, but that first phase was uh, like as open innovation as you can go. Wow, amazing. And so at that stage, you would yeah, you were just experimenting with all kinds of different things. This one seemed to find the zeitgeist and people got really excited. So is this basically the way you started setting up a company? Yeah, so we applied for a few competitions. We actually got kind of a grant from the European Union for an accelerator called Climate Kick back then that um, supports uh, climate change related challenges or startups addressing those challenges and also um, a couple of design awards the lexus design award so that just allowed us to get the first few thousands of pounds that we spent on uh, getting a few uh, chemists uh, or like phds at imperial college to start trying to refine things because at that point again like we were so far from a final product 
it was leaky, it was smelling like fish, it was fragile, so there was like no way that... This... Hang on, that's, my, that's, that's how I refer to Lee mostly, actually, <laughs> leaky and smelling <laughs> like fish. So we really had um, like a, a lot of uh, technical challenges to resolve. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so, yeah, we, we kind of like decided to properly incorporate the company so that we could actually go and like bank those checks. Again, we didn't really plan on being entrepreneurs because... We thought that you had to go to business school and I don't know, be really passionate about just building a business rather than the product itself that ends up uh, like having an impact. So we really had to learn on the go. We had lots of mentorship and support from some of those uh, institutions um, and realized that actually like um, there's no kind of like typical way to get into entrepreneurship. You just figure it out as you go. So you've got quite a few, your magic ingredients so far are your background in packaging, but then <laughs> you wondering what to do with your life and getting this. What was your master's in? I'm sorry. Yeah. So innovation design engineering. Cool. Okay. And your colleague from the Royal College of Design, what specialism was there? Before, before that, he was an architect and a, right. and a designer. Um, and he actually kind of like has five masters. He uh, studied until <laughs> his 30s because he just loves academia and he's been uh, like a, a, a professor as well. But um, he's um, always been the the very, how do we think something completely different yes. and working with materials in an unexpected way. So he worked with a lot of plastic waste for building um, architecture pavilions and things like this. So always quite interested in how do you flip it on its head and how do you make something that is kind of like going to make people stop. Cool. And then you... You, but you, you gave the early stuff away, basically, as you said, Creative Commons, you, you thought, hey, this is fun. And then the next magic ingredient was a level of public interest. And then so creating company, um, interesting for me is what has driven, is, is the success because this concept really appeals to the public and therefore is clearly saleable? Or is it also because it is a genuine challenge to plastic and a genuine sustainable alternative? Which I, I know it is, but I mean, which is the driver for you? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it's been a journey where it kind of like flips from one thing to another. Okay. Uh, our origin story very much has been that like, um, it came from people believing in this to actually get us going. And like a couple of steps, like post these, this like incorporation of the company and getting a few kind of accelerators is is uh, is basically working on some of the early uh, technical challenges and solving a few, but realistically with not very much money and like, virtually no team. So the first two years, we really didn't make that much progress. We were spending mostly our time catching up with uh, different media opportunities and trying to kind of uh, hustle for finding the next uh, 20K check for paying some more research at Imperial or whatever it is. And at the end, it was quite demoralizing that we couldn't find anyone to really believe in funding this in, the, in a big way. We had plans. We had kind of like this vision that we could actually make the machine and uh, like bring this to to much many more places but uh, at that point investors typically business angels or kind of like small vc funds they just didn't want to be the first one to take the risk everyone was like interested in the entertainment of the story but no mm -hmm. one wanted to kind of like really fund this because it was just too weird and bear in mind it's like 2014 2015 2016 it's pre David Attenborough and the Blue Planet 2 and all of these things. Yeah. So people didn't have that like emotional reaction to plastic. Um, and so um, what we ended up doing is give ourselves a deadline. Actually, our parents kind of gave us a, a deadline, like not paying for our rent anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we had to go all in and like, because investors didn't kind of like, our traditional investors didn't follow, we went to the crowd. So we did the equity crowdfunding campaign. We said, if by that date, we haven't found 400,000 pounds to execute on our plan, that's it. This is the end of the story. Um, and the most incredible thing happened again, thanks to like the people who wanted to see this uh, become a reality. In just three days of that mm -hmm. crowdfunding campaign, we had raised 850,000 pounds, so like more than oh. what we were looking for. We had some videos on Facebook that had 100 million views. And it was completely kind of like viral and and the number of companies that would kind of like reach out and be interested in doing something with us was, was just insane. So again, like the traditional method didn't work for us. We had to go to people who actually just wanted this to be a, a, an alternative available on the market. Um, so I think that that's kind of like how we got started. But then very much what is the, the heart of what we do today is working out how do we tackle 
those single-use plastics in the most scalable way? And how do we actually make this work at scale? Um, and, and, and today we are we are a team of 70 people across chemistry, engineering, design, peace dev, production. Last year, we made the first uh, million of a product. So that's really starting to be at scale. This year, we have potentially the capacity to make 50 million units. Um, so we're really starting to have kind of like a significant impact. Through a range of different products, uh, we expanded from the first bubbles that were kind of like mostly used for marathons, festivals. Now we have takeaway boxes where we do the coating made from a seaweed instead of plastic. We do films uh, for flexibles and sachets. We have a seaweed paper, some rigid material for injection molding. So it's really a platform where we can take seaweed and make it replace plastic. I'm living for the day. Anyway, you, I'll come back to you in a moment, Gwen, but I have a really annoying thing that I do, Pierre, and that's that I'm, I'm a frequent visitor to B&Q, and I do like buying tools and stuff like that, and I get really frustrated that things that are never going to degrade in any way, shape, or form are in plastic. Yeah. So I always take a pair of scissors with me, and I annoy the staff at B&Q by cutting everything out of the plastic and just kind of like leaving it, leaving it there. That's I'm perfect. living for the day yeah. when I can just eat it in front of them. Yeah. I mean, like, we eat fruits all the time it's not a weird thing like uh if like usually we say if you can eat it nature can eat it it's the ultimate proof that it's not some sort of bioplastic that is still making some microplastics still creating some sort of kind of like end of life problem so if we use things that truly come from nature they've been around this environment for a few billion years you know you're never going to create a long-lasting waste so the go back to magic ingredients the story is wonderful and the, the story is been such a huge part of it several times isn't it people have been so inspired by the beauty of the simplicity of the kind of underlying concept um but getting patenty for a minute because you know because of the ip bit of all this um you know as as you mentioned you know you took and then you've done a few unconventional things actually my first question before i did that is so your parents are happy now right yes very <laughs> i've been worried about that good 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 i bet they are um good that that aside um yeah that's very unusual to 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 release something that early stage but here you kind of got the inspiration um so um for those listening and you think oh well you give them away you can't patent it presumably as you've talked about the scalability and all the different products i'm guessing there's a huge amount of additional patentable work that you're now doing correct and i think this is a bit the like again like it served our story very well because no one would really take a, a bet on us that early. So we had to kind of like find something that would create a little bit that movement. And for us, it's been the enthusiasm of people. Um, but realistically, around the time, um, there was this company Soylent, which I find horrible. I'm French. Um, so people having the whole meal as just a drink is very uh, unacceptable. But the amazing thing is that the guys who started this, they basically listed the recipe so that anyone could actually just go and buy the raw, raw ingredients, like mm -hmm. the magnesium and the protein and whatever it is. But what they offered is like the convenience of a company just making that easy for you and making it like very applicable to your lifestyle. So they literally seeded their own competition, which was amazing because that was a very unconventional type of kind of like food mm -hmm. category. Yes, yes. So being alone is actually a detriment to that. Like you want to be the the biggest of like a group if you want to have like a, a market effect and so um i remember like being quite like uh, uh excited about this idea that um you need to have um others kind of like following on those tracks and also realistically if you're going to be the first you're going to get to solve all of the really hard challenges first and that's that follow on ip is the really hard bit the starting point is just the starting point. But like the first person who's making a million of those takeaway boxes that we're making now, the number of things that go wrong from the moment that you kind of think, okay, like seaweed and cardboard, and the moment that you've got like truckloads delivering this in like countries around Europe, you've got a ton of things that are not kind of like easy to work out and you get to solve them first. So if getting to the position of having the cash to be able to have the team to go and kind of like solve those problems that's worth kind of like the trade no of course i don't think um well, it's 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 well known that um the moment someone when the big players see something working that's when they get involved they have a look and say oh look someone else has, someone else has done all, all the hard work <laughs> this works this has got a market let's see what we can do about that as well just get, did you say soylent Yes, Soylent. That's grim. That was a 1970s film where it's made out of people, wasn't it? 
I think it's uh, like soil and green. It's a movie with Charlton Heston. Yeah, it, it's like this like protein shake thing for people who want to skip a meal. Uh, yeah, like uh, not my thing, but uh, again, like they, they had like a very interesting take on not trying to protect their recipe and just kind of like having it literally as a, a tab on their web page where you could literally, literally see 16% of this, 12% of that. Yeah, A lot of these models are, these are new models now and they're facilitated by the fact, you know, you talked about 100 million YouTube views. That would well, podcast didn't exist 15 years ago, but if they did, that would have made no sense. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you mean? How, how could that help anything? I don't know what you're talking about. So it's funny how people are using you know the new opportunities and new ways of doing things to, to launch businesses in really quite new ways. Yeah. Lee, we need to do a, a plug for the patent attorneys, don't we? We do, yeah, but it'd be unforgivable, wouldn't it, if we didn't mention that? We're, so let, but let's start by finding out how Pierre went about realizing that he needed a patent attorney. When did that happen? When did you decide actually we've got something here and we do need to apply a bit of protection to it? So I think we quickly realized in the first year really that there was going to be some um, special sauce here, something that was going to be really like technically significant to solve all of those challenges that we were seeing from, from the early experiments of the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And so as we started to get on that path, we realized that it was really good for us to understand how we could create assets that would allow us to fundraise easier investors love patents so it was one of the main driver um and and i think that like it was also knowing what we solve um so knowing what is so special about what we do there's some things that are relatively kind of like patentable others that are better uh, protected as trade secrets so we needed to have someone to give us a little bit the uh, the rundown of how do you approach defensibility um and so uh, because we had been uh, incubated in imperial college incubator there was definitely a lot of like free support on IP and like one of the IP lawyer uh, there, Jeremy Holmes, uh, who's been very helpful in the early days, gave us a really good kind of like understanding of what value we could create if we did things right and how we need people um, that are specialized in this field to kind of like help us navigate this relatively complex space. So um, we've been with a few different kind of like firms over the years, but it's always been quite helpful to have someone that like goes with the general knowledge of what all of this means rather than just a tunnel vision like we have sometimes. It's like lovely to hear Jeremy get a shout out. Jeremy is a member of SEPA Council. Okay, well, so, so here we go. So here we be really chuffed at the shout out. Um, we should say you're currently with um, Potter Clarkson, I think, is your um, Correct. Yeah. attorney of choice. Uh, Esme, Esme Svendel's there, I think, is the um, the person that's been involved. Um, you don't need to talk You don't need to talk specifically about the relationship with P- Potter Clarkson unless you feel you need to, but... Um, T- t- so t- tell it why why are you with Potters? What, why are you there? So um, in particularly like uh, uh, like with Esme, I think we we really found finally someone that um, was trying to really like meet us in the middle and try to understand what was happening here. What we do is at the intersection of many different fields. There's like. Uh, the biology of of seaweed. There's the chemistry. There is the, the 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 manufacturing kind of like technology. The process engineering. All of these things combined. It's sometimes hard to kind of like understand what is going to be best protected with a patent versus best protected by a, a trade secret. Um, and I think we found with uh, Potter Claxon and and especially with Esme that uh, we had someone who was not just doing the bare minimum of kind of like having something that works but really going in the, the details and trying to kind of like work it out collaboratively with us so that we have the best protection in place. Um, and, and so we've been extremely happy with um, how we've been able to do more with our IP with, with since we work with them. And obviously like uh, that's uh, all culminated with also them being the, the initial nominator through uh, SIPA. And uh, so thanks to SMA, uh, we, we got a shot at the, the Ostrad Prize. Amazing. That's a, a, just a truly amazing story, isn't it? It really is. It is not, actually a little plug for SEPA as well, because this is this 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 sounds almost destined to win your your concept. <laughs> Everyone loves it. Um, but it's exciting that SEPA, so it's a quick plug for the rest of us, yeah, sorry, uh had so many nominations, but yeah. out of out of all the 396 nominating organizations, whatever it was. We got 30 odd nominations. I'm not that surprised though, because of course we have the 
what's why you do this job actually you have the benefit of seeing these fantastic ideas before anyone else so we have a proper insight into all of that um but yeah chuff that one of the super ones got and they're also not surprised because of course we tend to be involved in the, the good tech you know that's that's, that's shot, shot now call us a super nominator Gwilym. not not just no, no <laughs> and not it. just because of volume but because all of the nominations are top class and it's yeah. and it is because we've got that insight into what's happening in the world of kind of tech and invention at the moment here's a plug for the patent system it's also very good at identifying good technology everyone's amazing this is so good we should um we should end or work our way towards conscious of time um a little bit about the whole letter experience if that's okay yeah sure. but first of all um I, this may have been on twitter i can't remember where it was but did, do i remember you saying that you replaced all of the plastic at, at the euros the women's euros is that right yeah so last year has been a really a year of like first for not plus because um, some of our products have been on a on a journey of industrialization that is not always hard and, and not always easy and definitely takes time. And so last year was the the year where we started to have like really great progress on making our uh, coating for takeaway boxes for food containers like at restaurants and stadiums and uh, outdoor events. And we have a, a long running relationship with Just Eat. Uh, takeaway.com um and we're now kind of like uh in, in europe in six of their different countries uh, where restaurants can use our boxes and um they're also a, like a partner of uh, the ufr and and uh the women's euro was one of their big the their big part, uh, partnership the of, of last year and so um while usually the catering at stadium is pre-locked in. There's like a, a lot of modes for the catering companies to make sure no one else can like come in and so on. Sure. Because this was a, a like a significant event and there were like significant sponsors, we managed to get the right to use only not plat packaging at the whole um, of the <laughs> like final of the, the Women's Euro. Um, so it was incredible for us because it was the first time that an entire stadium uh, of like uh, 50 plus uh, thousand people were able to kind of like go about consuming their hot dogs and burgers and uh, wings and whatever it is without using plastic, which was really exciting. Um, and we actually only found out uh, last week that uh, Prince William was actually in attendance. So he must have seen our, uh, our ah. packaging in action. Um, but he then, likes a hot dog. <laughs> so it was definitely a really great opportunity to kind of like <laughs> prove that at the scale of a stadium, we could supply. It was not just kind of like a, a, a small pilot of making like 10,000 this, 10,000 of that. Um, and since then, we've been using like uh, multiple other uh, finals. Um, and, and, and now we are really trying to be the one tendering for those contracts at the stadium so that we can supply not just the one off finals, but like throughout the year. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, actually, I'm going to ask a techie question, if that's right, before we before we do talk about the, the kind right. of Earthshot Prize at the end. Um, are you going to rid the world of seaweed? Is it all going to be consumed by your... That was my question. Yeah, where does all the materials where, yeah. where do the materials come from? So seaweed is really incredible. Um, some of the seaweed we use grow up to a meter per day. So it's one of the fastest growing organisms on the planet. And it's incredibly abundant uh, on uh, like almost every coastline. So we really have a lot of seaweed. Obviously, as as soon as humans get involved, there's always a good way and a bad way to get about it. But because seaweed is really kind of like our core ingredient, we can be a, like use our buying power to make sure that people um, do all of the supply chain around seaweed in the best way possible. Um, to give you a, a, an idea, like we work with uh, like seaweed from Europe mainly because we are active in Europe for now, uh, France, Spain, Norway. There's one place in Brittany where um, we get some seaweed from. They get the seaweed from like the 30, 40 kilometer kind of like radius around where they are based on the, the coastline of Brittany. And if we were using all of their current production, which mostly goes for like food or cosmetics or pharma, we could make a billion of our little bubbles. And that's just that little area um, around, around Brittany. So that just gives you a sense of the scale um, of, of how much seaweed there is and how much we can use it for replacing some of the single-use plastics that are unfortunately finding their way back into the ocean and staying there for hundreds of years and, and i guess I um so I'm, I'm i'm thinking tangentially now and you're probably going to tell me i'm wrong um but i'm guessing you don't even need things like i want to say clean water that's not right but um yeah you can use salt water and stuff like you know it's 
everything is natural in this, isn't it? You, you, you don't you don't need fresh water to grow seaweed. You can use the seawater. It's it is where I was going. I think I don't know what I'm talking about. Just ignore me. You're right. Um, seaweed doesn't need any fresh water to grow. It doesn't need fertilizers because anyway, it's not like you can fertilize a chunk of the ocean and not the rest. So there is no kind of like. Oh, we're, we're, no, we're, we, are, we are trying in the UK. Our water companies are trying. Don't worry. <laughs> so we should put more seaweed just around there. But actually, <laughs> oh, no, it's really that, like yeah. an incredible kind of like regenerative force in the ocean. Because actually, there's lots of dead zones in the ocean, and seaweed is usually the first thing that provides food and shelter for fisheries to come back, gastropods. So actually, bringing back more seaweed in the ocean is a really great thing to do. So seaweed farming is really uh, something that has a lot of potential in Europe. And if we can collect a portion of that as it keeps on growing for making an alternative to plastic, we have a, a really wonderful circular system. I have a funny image at the moment of a seaweed farmer. It's sort of looking a bit like Aquaman, but on a combine harvester. So it's funny because it's actually very similar to the activities of uh, like seashell farming um, okay. water. So you have like buoys and uh, you have kind of like lines where you seed um, some of that seaweed and it just grows and you just have to go and pick it up at harvest time. So it's a, a really simple uh, like system that works in conjunction with uh with the ocean and we work very closely with a, a seaweed farm in wales called carrymore who is really trying to kind of like pioneer that uh in the uk so tell us just a little bit because hopefully we're going to put this out to people who might be considering being nominated and certainly for our for our members who will be considering nominating people uh, what difference did the actual being nominated make to you was there was there work that you had to do prep that you had to do for the awards so uh, it starts by um, like providing some high level kind of like information about the kind of impact that your company has and can have and some of your kind of like ambitions. Um, it's not very onerous, but it's definitely like forcing you to think in terms of how you can scale that impact, which is quite a useful thing to do. Um, and this is essentially what the uh, what, what the nominator is then kind of like. Uh, providing to the Earthshop team, who is then going through a, a huge kind of like work to pick from some of those, I think over like a, a thousand uh, nominations to actually pick um, um, uh, like a smaller group that they are doing like some further kind of like uh, work of due diligence on. Um, I think the, the process changes every year, but for us, there was a deep involvement of uh, like Deloitte, who really facilitated a lot of uh, the conversation to try to understand the potential, but also the risks, some of the things that might be um, like not so aligned with the goals of the Earthshot Prize. So we had like follow-on conversations, some documents to fill up and a little bit more kind of like giving a bit more color to the whole um, like to our application. And um, I think the <clears throat> the final step was to, get, to make a, a very catchy two, three minute video that just in a very concise way catches all of the important topics about your solution. Um, and then they did their magic in the background. So you don't really know if you're kind of like um, uh, doing well or not. You just know whether you progress. And the amazing thing about the Oscar Prize is that everyone focuses a lot on like the winner who takes uh, home or like the winners who take home uh, a, a million pounds. But actually like the 15 finalists, they all get part of this uh, Oscar Prize fellowship that is a year long kind of like support uh, program where they really try to accelerate your impact by connecting you with um, like basically anyone that can be important for you to kind of like accelerate your, your growth. So as I mentioned last week, we were at uh, uh, Windsor for a whole week of retreat where we had incredible kind of like speakers and uh, like entrepreneurs and, and people from like all sorts of different leaders to help us kind of like think differently about our business, how to kind of like do things better. Uh, we met the, the prince um, and there's a lot of kind of involvement from uh, him as well. He's even going to, we have to pick one name and he's going to write a letter to that person to invite them to meet us. So that's like kind of like a magic ticket kind of like opportunity. So we, we are, we are trying to think right now of who is going to be that person because that's like a, once in a lifetime kind of like opportunity to get uh, Prince William to actually kind of like do the intro. Um, and overall, yeah, like the, the the community, the cohort that they've created, the global alliance of all of the different companies that have signed up to support the Earthshot Prize 
is a really valuable network. So I would highly, highly recommend to kind of like uh, go and, and 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 apply, find a, a nominator like uh, SIPA and just kind of like go through the application process. So that's, uh, and that's a great way to finish, isn't it? So um, so your, your story's been amazing, but also your advice coming out of this is go for it. This is something that's really worth doing. 100%. Uh, Pierre, thank you for sharing your time with us. Um, no it's been a ama- an amazing listen, and um, and I know that you've stayed in touch with Sipa throughout this whole process. So, so thank you for that. Before we finish, though, um, I usually finish for Gwillem on a kind of like a, a a question tangentially related to the podcast, and you've given me my question. So, thank you very much for that because I was I was sat here struggling, wondering what it might be. So, Gwillem, what I'm going to ask you and Pierre, and you don't have to answer this from the Prince William Pierre perspective, Pierre. If someone influential would write a letter on your behalf to get you to meet someone you've always <laughs> wanted to meet, who would it be, Gwillem? Who would you? Me, oh, it'd be Mother Teresa. She's dead. Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> He's dead. Could you could you try and focus on perhaps someone who you might have a chance of meeting? Einstein, he's dead, isn't he? Oh, all the good ones. Um, I actually knew you were going to ask this question. <laughs> well, it was either this or what would you do with a million pounds? And obviously, yeah. I'm, I'm, so, a million I'm so pounds. predictable. I'm so predictable. I know, but just for the record, if it was a million pounds, I'd give it to the Earthshot Prize to help sustainability. Um, uh, somebody somebody here now, um, oh, I wish I was thinking harder about this. I think it has to be Lady Gaga. Oh wow! Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can see the attraction there. You've got a, got a similar mindset, same same fashion yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just dress through. I just dress in seaweed, not bacon. <laughs> Brilliant. Go on, Pierre. Who would yours be? It doesn't. It doesn't need to be in relation to the business. Now. It could be anyone. Anyone. So I mean, like, it's really hard because it's a true question for us. So it's not like hypothetical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll answer it hypothetically somewhere else. <laughs> um, so I think the way we're thinking is like. First of all, if there's a, a business that could do something directly now with the products that we have ready, so we are thinking of a few uh, Compass Group, Bunzel, some of the companies that really are big distributors of, of takeaway packaging. Um, there's also like the companies that have, uh, in the long run, maybe some of the most strategic uh, input, like uh, Tetra Pak or Amcor. That would be great. Um, and then there's like the the people who could really influence things. So wouldn't it be great to have kind of like a chat with uh, Barack Obama? or Greta, or um, uh, Al Gore, or someone who is really kind of like regarded as a, as, as a setting the direction of travel for every, for for some of these things. So it's very hard to kind of like land on a name. Um, yeah, yeah. Have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Can, can, can I replace Lady Gaga with Barack Obama? That's better. That's, that is better. <laughs> Lee, go on. Oh, my, my my one's fairly obvious. I, I'm, I'm a lifelong fan of the Smiths, as you know, Gwilym. I never want to meet Morrissey again as long as I live. I've met him once. Um, but I would I would dearly love to meet Johnny Marr. Thank you. That would be mine. It's top of my list. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm a very easily pleased. So, Pierre, thank you so much no for sharing your time and your story with us. It's been absolutely amazing. Gwilym, thanks for pitching up again and making up the numbers. That's always much appreciated. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you on the next one, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers. Leaky and smells of fish.